Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show that we run every single week in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, sometimes the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for my other Beatles program, which is a weekly syndicated Beatles music show called Every Little Thing, heard on almost 30 radio stations right now. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts. First of all, in California, we've got the man who writes for Billboard.com, AccessAXS.com, Variety.com. Goldmine, a whole bunch of publications, and uh, also the author of uh, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, and that's our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also, we have our resident musicologist who writes for Beatle Fan, for the Wall Street Journal. He's a freelance writer who, for many years, worked in the classical department at the New York Times and has written a number of Beatle books, including the recent ebook, Got That Something. How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Steve. And hello, everyone out there. On today's show, we're going to do part two of uh, our thoughts about how the Beatles in their solo careers have preserved their legacy. And in our last show, we tackled John and Ringo. And in today's show, we're going to talk about George and Paul. But before we do that, we've got a bunch of news to get to. And we have to start by talking about, and this is not easy to talk about, uh, the fact that as we're taping the show, which is on Monday, October the 2nd, we heard the news that last night Tom Petty suffered cardiac arrest at his home in Malibu. As we are doing this show, we don't really know all the details of his status The reports that we have at the moment is that he's still alive. We don't really know what to say about it because we don't really have all the facts. And like so many fans, we're glued to the Internet and trying to find out every detail if we can. But, um, you know, guys, any thoughts about what we've heard about Tom Petty? Steve? Well, I mean, there isn't really that much to say except, you know, um, the indications are not good, but we hope. If he can, he can can come out of it. Uh, It's, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of confusing news today about, you know, what what happened. I mean, the initial report was from TMC, which isn't a great source to begin with. But uh, the the news has been really sketchy, and and the petty people haven't been apparently talking to the press. But I I just hope, uh, you know, that... uh, if you can pull through, he does. That's that's about all you can say, I think. Yeah, we could talk about what the reports have said, but we don't really know the facts. And, and that would be just the most honest thing that we could say. There have been reports of brain inactivity, and uh, we just don't know really what's going on right now. Obviously, we're all praying for the best. Right. Um, Alan, you want to say anything? Um, I, I think you've basically covered it. I mean, it's, you know, he he was... The reports have been uh, a little premature um, all through the afternoon, and uh, there was uh, apparently a Los Angeles Police Department confirmation, and then they said that they that they were in error. His daughter um, posted. Uh, there's something on on Twitter now where she's um, actually um, quite justifiably angry at Rolling Stone for um, you know posting a. a a story saying that he had died. Uh, there's, there's the thing is that a lot of news organizations are going with, you know, once one news organization confirms it or thinks they've confirmed it, everybody is going to pick that up. And right. um, partly because we're in a 24 hour news cycle now and there's you know, fierce competition and everybody wants the news and wants it first. Um, I think there's a little less care being taken now than there was in former times when life was a little bit slower than it is now. Well, Mm. the important thing to remember is that CBS got the confirmation from the LAPD and they, or that, and that's what they reported. And that the, the initial report had come from TMZ, which is not a source that you want to base your story on speaking as, you know, somebody who worked in a newspaper business. It's, it's just not, but when the LAPD confirms it, that is a source. Now, what 
probably should have been an indication is that is when LAPD confirmed it and CBS wrote up their story, nobody else had other had confirmation of it the mm. same way. That was kind of a, a telling you know, a telling but, but it's hard to make a judgment on that in the initial flurry of you know, news reports, and I know people have been justifiably, justifiably, you know, upset about the fact that these reports have come out. But yeah. as speaking as speaking as you know, as people who have done stories, again, it, like you said, Alan, they, you know, there is a rush now. But at the same time, when you have a confirmation from a, a source like LAPD, yeah, however, you usually trust it. Yeah, if if however I were a somewhat calmer editor sitting there and the journalist had come to me and said LAPD has confirmed it, I mean I would have asked the logical question, which is what does the LAPD have to do with this? It was not a homicide. And that of course is what the LAPD came back and and explained in their retraction. This isn't something right. that, that we investigate. This isn't something we have anything to do with. Um so the LAPD saying it, the LAPD said it sounds official, but they probably are not the best source to have gone to. Um, you know, what basically what probably happened is that a reporter from CBS would have called the LAPD because no one else is talking and asked a question. And someone at the LAPD, having read the same stuff on the Internet as everybody else, said, yeah, you know, yeah, isn't that sad? But mm. th that's not really, you know, this is why, no. I mean, for at the times we needed two sources of confirmation for anything. We couldn't, um, and for, for obits, it had to be a family member. Um, right. You know, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big mess. I mean, from the reports that we've had, it doesn't sound very hopeful, but uh, I think we, we all hope that, that he pulls through and that a week from now, We'll just think of this as a big scare, you know, and all look into sort of, uh, you know, cardiac health from now on. <laughs> yeah, I know that I've, I've been looking all day on Facebook and so many of my friends are posting it like it's official, mm -hmm. you know, that, that he's dead. And all that I'm doing before I even post anything myself is waiting for the family to say something or someone close to Tom to say something. Mm -hmm. So... You know, obviously, we are hoping for the best. By the time this show is posted, the worst may have happened. We certainly hope that's not the case. But if, in fact, Tom does pass away, we'll be certain to do some kind of tribute to him on the show next week. All right? Okay. Okay. So on to other news. Uh, we do have news about the demo for what goes on uh, officially sold. Steve, you want to talk about it? Yeah, it did. It sold uh, uh, yesterday on eBay for thirteen thousand six hundred and forty-nine dollars, or uh, ten thousand two hundred. The actual price was ten thousand two hundred pounds on uh, on the on the bid, and I don't know if that includes uh, a, you know any extras tacked on by the the auction house. But uh, the the U.S. translation of that is thirteen thousand six hundred and forty-nine dollars. It was uh, the the auction dealer told me that it was a private collector based in Europe. You can take from that what you want to, folks. Um, but because um, I know a lot of people are hoping they'll hear the whole thing, um, whether they oh. will, or, we don't know that. I don't have any other information besides that, but that's what I, that's what my sources told me. Yeah. So yeah. there that's we go. More, and Ed, I'm just saying that's what we're all hoping for that we can hear the full right. demo. Because uh, thirty seconds certainly isn't enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, there were there were there were only thirty eight bids, which it really I thought it was going to be a little more crazy than that. But um, whatever. Um, it and in fact, when I looked, I was I happened to get in on the on the uh, eBay page in the last few minutes, and it was ten thousand one hundred one hundred. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, ten thousand one hundred pounds up until about the last 10 seconds and then it boom, then it went up to 200 so um, anyway there we go doesn't that always happen at the end you know yes. the last few minutes <laughs> yes that's why I never that's why I don't like to bid on eBay because there's ways to screw people up like that and it's just it's really I 
lost things that way before and it's, so I don't even I, I'm not one of those people that spends a lot of time on eBay mm. not, not also, for stuff like that speaking of auctions uh, we were talking about George Harrison's sitar one of his sitars being mm-hmm. up for auction and that has sold as well that sold for $62,500 by Nate D. Sanders auctions and when I wrote it up I was surprised to find out that one of the letters of authenticity was written by Patty Boyd, who said George played Norwegian Wood for her on it when they were on their honeymoon, which is kind of a cute story. The second, mm. uh, the second letter of authenticity was written by George Drummond, the friend, uh, a friend of Patty Boyd's, who got the the sitar from George Harrison. So, but that's a, I thought that was a cute story that George actually played Norwegian Wood for her on mm-hmm. that uh, sitar. So. But it, this, I thought this was the sitar that George actually played the Beatles recording of. No, no, no. no. There, was never any, there was never any inference in the – I mean, they – Saunders tried to say that they thought it was. And that's you know a situation that happens with a lot of these auction – things that are auctioned where they – even if they don't know for sure, they try to – drum up you know as much interest in these things as possible by saying that you know it had something to do with the song in this case it did have something to do with the song but not necessarily the fact that it was used to record george uh, norwegian wood they thought they they said they were pretty sure but they didn't have any positive well, proof that it did i have an article from the bbc that says that it was the same sitar but they could be wrong well, I got my information directly from the bidding information. Okay. So the bidding information said that they thought it was, but that doesn't mean – but they, they weren't saying absolutely that it was. I, th- I think there's a – you have to make that distinction there, that just because the auction house thinks it is, they don't do as much research as you would like to think they do. Okay. In fact, I remember one – I can't remember exactly what it was. There was something uh, associated with John Lennon that was auctioned many years ago that turned out to be th- – their claims for it were wrong. So, yeah, it's it's happened. It's happened before. You can't trust these things as you know great sources. So. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we have some news about a new album coming out on George Martin's – compositions and film scores and it's actually titled george martin the film scores and original orchestral compositions it's coming out on november the 10th on the label atlas realizations and then it says ps pias classics label Mm -hmm. and uh you know more about this alan um yeah it's actually called um film scores and original orchestral music um, oh. And uh, according to the press release and the cover picture, at least, uh, and it's performed by the Berlin Music Ensemble, conducted by Craig Leon. Don't know either the group or the conductor, um, but it brings together new performances of some of his film music. Um, a lot of which, you know, we all know, like the uh, five five movement Pepperland Suite. Um, mm-hmm. from Yellow Submarine, uh, the orche- the orchestral music that he wrote for Live and Let Die. Um, that's uh, three tracks of that. Mm-hmm. Actually, actually, four tracks of that. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, there are three movements of um, American sketches for violin and chamber orchestra. Um, this is a piece I don't think we have heard before. There's a piece called Judy's Theme, presumably for his wife, um, that I haven't heard before. Uh, the overture for Under Milkwood. Um, probably a lot. some listeners have heard Under Milkwood. It was a two-CD set of music that George Martin did for um, a production of Dylan Thomas's under Milkwood, um, that brought together a lot of people that we know. It was a completely Welsh cast because Dylan Thomas was Welsh, so Mary Hopkin was in it, and Tom Jones, and all kinds of people, and George Martin did the music for that. Here, we're just getting the overture. 
Uh, and then a, a bunch of small pieces, a, a thing called Belle Etoile, which is a first recording, a waltz in D minor for flute and chamber orchestra, prelude for strings, and then um, like 10 choral pieces that he wrote for the film The Mission. So and I, I don't think those have been either available for, for or easy to come by. I've never run into them. But so that's it. It's a it's a, a new collection of George Martin's film music, and uh, I think it's a, think it's a nice idea. Yeah, it's kind of ironic that we're mentioning this because a few shows ago, we had Ken Womack on to talk right. about his new book on George Martin, Maximum Volume, and I did ask him the question: uh, Are there compositions from George Martin that we don't even know about, or can we find out more information about it? And and he had talked about that, and here on this very same compilation, we're going to get some things that have never even been released before. Mm-hmm. So, and also, I hear that there'll be a limited edition double vinyl version of this, right? And that's coming out in January, right? So, and the, and the uh, CD and digital release is November tenth, right? Okay, so, yeah. Obviously, evidently, someone you know listened to the to the show and went right out and. Recorded these things in Russian. That's Russian. right. <laughs> Which it shows the so powerful influence we are. That's it. That's it. <laughs> there we go. And then we have one final item here, which concerns Danny Harrison. His first solo album, In Parallel, comes out October 6th, which is this Friday. If you'd like to hear the entire album, you can do so on NPR's website. And they have a series called First Listen. So if you bring up his name, you'll be able to hear all the tracks on Danny's new album. All right. Okay. Anybody else have okay. something to say in the news? No. All right. So let's continue here with part two of our conversation concerning the solo careers of the Beatles and how well we think each of the four of them have preserved their legacy for their solo uh, career and catalog. And we're now up to George Harrison. I'll tell you guys my thoughts, but I think I'd rather hear from both of you first. So why don't we start with Alan? Okay. Last week when we talked about Ringo's and John's legacies, we sort of began with the idea of the uh, the, the reissues of the standard albums. And in that area, I think we have to give the Harrisons... Um, pretty high marks because they put out those two very attractive box sets, uh, one of the Apple years, one of the Dark Horse years. Um, I think the contents of those sets are reissued separately too, but the sets come with a box, a you know, DVD with videos, and um, you know they're, they're very nicely done, and it is the, the basic whole catalog. There are little bits missing, uh, like the tracks he did for the Bunburys and a uh, couple of things here and there. It's, it's almost uh, like Ringo and Scouse the Mouse. There are just these little tracks here and there that really should be collected onto a, a, a single disc uh, or collection that uh, mm-hmm. George did. I mean, and there are also songs that he wrote for other people but never recorded himself, you know, things that he did that Eric Clapton's done, I think Abandoned Love, and um, there were some other things that, you know, perhaps should be sort of dragged in together too. And, of course, there are lots of unreleased things, very little, little of which we've had officially. I mean, we had, you know, the first installment of what one assumes is a series of you know demos or first takes or you know early versions of his songs and i think by saying volume one they were presumably telling us that there would at least be a volume two if not three four five etc but i think there is actually a lot of material in george's archive that needs to come out we don't have any idea how much material because um unlike say with John Lennon, where Yoko gave Westwood One all that demo material, um, none of that has happened with the Harrison estate. You know, they could at this point still be in the process of seriously cataloging the stuff, who knows. But, um, you know, you also have to figure, 
George was a musician, and he was a musician who, even when he wasn't doing very much, would periodically come out and do an appearance with someone, you know, Deep Purple in Australia or, you know, that that heartbeat uh, thing in 1986 was a hospital charity where he played, um, I think it was Johnny B. Good, which also should be one of those things that's collected. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got to assume that he was writing music and recording it in his studio, and we don't know what that stuff is. So I'd love to hear some of it. I'd love to hear more demos. Um, when we did the bootleg show a few weeks ago, um, you know, there was all the material leading up to all things must pass, you know, a lot of acoustic versions of those songs and pre specter versions of those songs. Um, beware of Abco. Yeah, Beware of Abco, mm -hmm. Songs for Patty, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh of bootlegs of that material. And uh, you know, that that would be really interesting to hear and I I'd love for them to put out another box set of unreleased stuff that shows us some of his working process. Um, and also there's, you know, there have been video reissues of Wonderwall, which he wrote the score for, and Bangladesh, the Bangladesh concert, which he organized and uh, was basically the central star of On a Stage Full of Stars. Uh, so, you know, basically a, an awful lot of what he put out when he was alive has come out in, you know, nice spiffy reissues. Um, I think it's... It's the extra stuff and the odd bits hanging around the periphery that we sort of need to see collected. Mm. All right. Yeah, you raise a good point there, Alan, because we don't really know how much unreleased material there is right. from George. But the one thing that we do know is that he had his own studio. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, ever, ever since he moved into, uh, you know, in Henley. You know, he's had his own studio. He could have recorded whenever he wanted to. Mm -hmm. And there could be loads of material that it's just a matter of going through it all mm -hmm. and picking picking out the best bits. Yeah. Um, you know, there are things like, like I Don't Want to Do It, you know, which was for a film. Uh, Pork, there, yeah, Porky's. Porky's Revenge. Pork, and, right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just a lot of these little things and not to mention – remixes and edits of a lot of the things that were released as singles. And, you know, that's not necessarily the most fascinating stuff. We already know the songs, but it is kind of interesting, and a lot of people collect those things, and uh, it would be good to see them pull together. Mm-hmm. That's Steve. right. Actually, I Don't Want to Do It was, was included in the, the compilation of Let It Roll mm -hmm. when that came out, so it's not like it's been neglected. But, but I think there are two mixes of I Don't Want to Do It. I think that, a, there you go. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> you got me on that. <laughs> All right, Steve? Well, and, uh, I agree with, with what Alan said. I mean, he's basically – they've basically taken care, good care of the stuff he put out while he was alive with those box sets. Um, I think the one place that they really could do something if they really wanted to – is to collect all his guest appearances on other records, mm -hmm. and also especially that you know he did a lot of stuff on with the the Dark Horse label. There's uh, there's some great tracks, uh, uh, Dwayne Eddy theme, theme from something important. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a ton of those type of things where he appeared on other people's records. That would be a great tribute because I mean he wasn't just playing in the background. He wasn't just you know, uh, covered up in the background, you could actually hear him. And I think it'd be great to have all those things collected, you know, all those guest appearances. Uh, I think that would be great, along with some of those things like I Don't Want to Do It and some of the live, uh, uh, what's the one live track from the Dylan show that didn't get, it was it Absolutely Sweet Marie that didn't get uh, put on the original um, CD? Yeah, so. uh, on, on the On the Dylan, the double CD? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if not for you, was it? If not, not for you, was it? Yeah. If not for okay, absolutely. I, I remember absolutely sweet Marie because it was such a he did such a wonderful version of that. Yeah. But yeah, the if not for you uh, um, from there. I mean, there's just so many of those, like you said, out in the odds and ends tracks that haven't been that haven't been put uh, out. But um, I mean, basically, they've done they've done a fairly good job. They should they really need to apparently. 
No, I haven't. Uh, I, I guess a uh, concert from Bangladesh is kind of hard to get now on DVD. That should that shouldn't be. That that should be that should be out. It would be nice if we could get um, uh, the full uh, live in Japan concert, which mm-hmm. they apparently do have. Uh, which I'm guess they have to have it. I mean, if they put out, well, they do because they put out, uh, you know, the album. Individual and, songs. Well, they put yeah. out the they put out the album too. It'd be great if we had the video from that. Um, but I'm saying there are videos for individual songs that have come out from there. Right, just a few though, not the whole. Yeah. Not the whole thing. That would be nice. Um, and uh, I know individual, a couple of labels, uh, independent labels, have put out um, George Harrison jukebox CDs. You know, ga- uh, gathering his influences together. And I think those would be really kind of nice to have uh, more widely available. Um, although, obviously, when you get into stuff like that, the uh, licensing issue gets to be kind of uh, uh, sticky. But in any event, um, you know they've they've done a fairly they've done a fairly good job. I guess the biggest thing that we would you know that I I would like to see is extra tracks volume two and all. and there and and Alan is correct about the unreleased stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of unreleased Harrison, especially the. All Things Must Pass sessions. There's a ton of that, and it's gorgeous. I don't know why. What's holding them off from do, from doing something with that? Um, mm-hmm. That would be nice to have too. So, pretty good marks for the Harrison uh, Estate. Oh, okay. And and I would say Shanghai Surprise needs to the uh, soundtrack from Shanghai Surprise needs to come out because uh, I think that uh, that whole that album. They were going to do one anyway, and he decided not to. So, yeah, and it's also nice to have a different version of someplace else, mm-hmm. which is in there. And from right. what Lawrence Lawrence Juber told me, he plays on that version. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, I have a different opinion than you guys do. Mm. <laughs> as far as first of all, I always like to bring up compilations, and there has never been a great Harrison compilation in a solo career. The best of George Harrison was an abomination, and that was done by Capitol Records, and George himself didn't like what was done because half of it was George's Beatles songs. <laughs> and then we had the best of Dark Horse, which is actually a pretty good collection, but it was strictly the songs from his Dark Horse label. If you think of it from that standpoint, it's a good collection. As an overview of his entire career, it's not. And then uh, more recently, you had Let It Roll, Songs by George Harrison, which I think Olivia said was not really a greatest hits compilation. But it, we really need, at this point, at least a two-CD compilation of the best of George from his entire solo career. I, I, believe, and, I believe Let It Roll was supposed to be two CDs, but that got turned down. Okay. Well, so, for whatever reason, we still, we've never had anything really decent, I feel, that represents George's entire solo career. And also, they didn't have to put live versions of Beatles songs from the concert for Bangladesh in Let It Roll. You know, it could have been strictly his solo compositions. But I think that, you know, a catalog suffers like that. You do need to, as I said before, periodically put out compilations. And just like what we said with Ringo, every 10 years or so, and Ringo is worthy of a two CD compilation. Certainly, George Harrison is too. And we've never had anything like that with the hits and a lot of really choice album cuts through the years. So, and I I would hope that gets corrected in the future. I do think that the Harrison, the handling of his catalog deserves an A plus for all the reissues, the remastering of his albums, because I think the sound quality is just really good on everything. And I I in particular think that the, the sound quality on the Dark Horse albums is fantastic. It's bright, it's punchy. I really like the production on the Dark Horse albums especially. But um, overall, I think they did a great job at reissuing and remastering his albums. In some ways, I do feel that in trying to preserve a legacy, one of the most important things you have to do, first of all, is make sure that all the music is available and in print, first of all, and that it's in the best, utmost sound quality. And I think that George has done almost that. There's a few songs here and there that are not in print. But for the most part, as far as his albums are concerned, they've done a great job there. Let's see what else. The uh, the two tours, there's been nothing from the 1974 tour. Yeah, that's a hard and, one. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And um, I've never actually seen, and maybe our listeners can help out with this, I've never seen a quote from Danny or Olivia or even George that would tell us whether or not there's a good quality, complete concert from 1974 how can you not have something represent that tour even though he got bad reviews for it it's his only but full tour there are there, yeah, no, there and are there are bootlegs of every single show and i think we know that there is nothing that they would want to put out uh, in in terms of a, a full concert i mean he 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 had destroyed his voice in rehearsal before he even got onto stage a stage anywhere you know, I understand what you're saying. I'd love a nineteen, a, 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 an official soundboard quality 1974 concert too, even knowing what the state of his voice was. But um, uh-huh. but I, I don't think you can expect the estate to put one out. I think there is a good quality one. I, I think the I can't remember the I th- I, I'm thinking here, and I th- I think Cow Palace is decent, but I can't remember for sure. Yeah. But I think there is one good one from that tour. But again, that wasn't a great tour to begin with. So, but I, it's the I, only full one, and just for history's sake, yeah. just for that, I don't think it would ruin his reputation in any way, really. And if you, there should also be a DVD of that. Yeah. When you think yeah. about it, they, we, they, we they saw don't. some footage in the Scorsese thing, so we know that there is some stuff that that would be great to see. You know, just yeah. like we said about John. Yeah. He never did a tour. We have these few select examples of concert appearances where he did a few songs. Mm-hmm. We've got TV appearances. All that should be even more important because we don't have anything else. Right. So in the case of George Harrison, if all you got is the 74 tour and the tour of Japan, we should have complete concerts of both audio and video. Mm-hmm. And there, there comes a time when you have to put aside what the quality of his voice was or you know, whether he was not happy with the performance. I'm sure you know, because of the fact that it's so rare and this is all we got, <laughs> yeah. there's got to be something that we can have to represent, you know, a full George Harrison show and good quality on DVD and audio. You know, it's 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 really sad that we don't have anything like that. Well, that's where the Japan the Japan show comes in. I mean, we know that's good quality, mm-hmm. um, and it's got Eric Clapton. If anything, if they'll put out anything, they'll put that out first. That yeah. I really I really doubt you'll see the that seventy four tour um, as much as I would wouldn't mind it i mean i'll i'll take anything but thinking you know thinking that the way you know what I, the way i think they think they won't do it and and i mean getting getting a little ahead i mean that's the same that's the same for any of them um you know they're not going to put anything out that that they don't want to put out so uh, you know i don't know how you can you can argue that they should put it you know it's not going to hurt their repu- reputation that's not the way they see it We've had so, the same argument before, and I've been on the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, where the Beatles are concerned, because I'm sure that so many fans want everything to come out, mm-hmm. every, every take of every song. Mm-hmm. And I've argued the fact that the Beatles have always been very particular, and they only want the highest quality that's out there, and that's reflected in what they released. So I'm just saying only in this particular instance, because of the fact that we only had those two tours... Mm-hmm. That's why I feel that they're more important. If George Harrison did a tour every few years, then it wouldn't bother me as much. But this is all we have. So I think for that reason alone, I, I do believe it's worth putting out. Doesn't mean they're going to do it. That's just you know my two cents. You know, you could also um, make the argument that since all of the stuff is out on bootleg anyway, they really ought to at least you know put out something in really good quality as, as a way of um, – you know, countering that in a way, you know, because you're you're getting it on bootleg, and and if it's you know most of them are audience tapes, um, there are are a couple of soundboards from '74, I think, but most are audience tapes, and so you're not even hearing the concerts at their optimum, um, no matter what you think of them, and you know the the problems with his voice and all that can be handled in liner notes and perhaps um, explanatory interview material and on a DVD. 
Um, it can all be dealt with, you know, simply with the recognition that this is a historical moment that is not otherwise available. You know, right. I, and I kind of agree with you that it should come out. I, I just like, you know, and I agree with Steve that they probably won't put it out because, you mm-hmm. know, um, so there's and one. Especially, other, and especially they've been, I mean, getting back to, to Georgia again, they've been especially delicate with what they've done. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they've been even more, you know, uh, they've been more hands, you know, I mean, they've been more, uh, I, I guess, I don't know what uh, delicate, I guess is the, is the word, but I can think of than 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 John, than Yoko has been with Lennon. I mean, she's been so, uh, we, we said how free she's been with John stuff and, they haven't been that way with George at all, and you would think by now there would be more. Yeah. And that's you know that's the bad. That's you know they've done like I said like I said they've done good things with what he put out while he was alive, but you know as far as I mean outside of of uh, uh, outside of brainwashed. Yeah. We haven't, you know, and, and I mean, they haven't really done that much, you know. Mm-hmm. And they did, they did remaster All Things Must Pass, and they did, you know, put a lot of stuff in there. Um, you know, they did put some unreleased stuff in there, but I mean, overall, there's there's just not a lot, you know. It'd be, it'd be great, to, and they've done, they've, you know, they've put some extra tracks on the on the on the CD reissues, but you know, by and large, there has not been much. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what you just said there, Steve, because if you look at all the, the remastered albums, the CDs that have come out, there have been bonus tracks, but there's very little on each album. And sometimes there are B-sides, 9LP B-sides, Miss Odell, Deep Blue, stuff like that. And sometimes there's different versions of songs. You know, there was a demo of Mystical One <laughs> on uh, Gon Chapo, stuff like that. But usually it's one or two tracks, um, and that's it. But it could very well be that Olivia and Danny are probably honoring George's wishes and not putting out something that George might feel is below par. But um, as far as your comment about putting together a compilation like we suggested of Ringo, of all these side projects, again, I would say there's probably clearance issues there. And I don't really see many artists doing that kind of thing anyway. I, it's, it's very interesting when you're studying the whole catalog of the Beatles to hear George play slide on a song for someone else, you know, or Ringo drumming for someone else. But I, I've never seen that really done as a compilation by an artist. They're side projects. It's a great idea, and they make for great bootlegs, which they have already done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And I also want to point out one of the things that I love the most are the tributes that have come out on George, especially the concert for George, which to me is one of the greatest concerts ever. Mm-hmm was so tastefully done by having all the people, or most of the people, who were closest to George in that concert. And also, I enjoyed the recent one that Danny was behind, uh, the George Fest uh, tribute show. Because as we've said, when other artists cover uh, your material, and that's a way for future generations to hear this music, it's, it's a way of, of uh, letting that legacy grow. And the more that that, uh, people cover your music, doesn't matter whether it's Beatles or solo, that keeps the music out there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important right there. So, you know, uh, kudos to the Harrison family for those two concerts right there. So, but I definitely, you know, my only complaint really is there's never been a, a really good compilation on George solo as far as I'm concerned. And something needs to be done about those two tours. And also... When it comes to talking about your own career, the Beatles as solo artists, and I think we said this in our last show, they talk about the newest project, maybe the Beatles, and that's it. Most of the documentaries that we've ever seen on the Beatles as solo artists are unauthorized. And Mm -hmm. so with the exception of Living in the Material World, which was a good documentary in a lot of ways, it did you know, all of a sudden breeze right by George's solo career after the Dark Horse tour up to the Traveling Wilburys. But there's some really good elements to that documentary. But you need more stuff like that. We, we applauded Yoko for all the different documentaries on John. There's only been, as far as from the Harrison camp, living in the material world. We need more 
more material like that out there, and there just hasn't been that much. We need a director's cut of that where Scorsese restores whatever he cut from Between All Things Must Pass and the Traveling Wilburys, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. or the 74 tour and Traveling Wilburys. Um, yeah. You know, there must be stuff that he cut, and um, it would be would be good to just have him restore that, do a director's cut. Every, everything else gets a director's cut. Why not this? Okay. Um, I'm all for that. <laughs> there's, you know, there's one other area we haven't touched with, on with George, and that is the books, the Genesis books. Mm. Um, you know, I Me Mine and uh, two volumes of songs of George Harrison and uh, Live in Japan. Now, Live in Japan is, you know, fundamentally a big deluxe picture book with the discs from the tour that, you know, they're the same discs you can buy separately as discs. So it's, that basically is just, you know, if you want the pictures and, um, you know, it's, it's a nice, beautiful production, but it's not, you know, absolutely essential. Uh, songs from George of George Harrison, um, did have the bonus discs that, uh, included some things that, at the time, were hard to come by. Uh, some of the <laughs> some of the outtakes from uh, somewhere in England. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, so that those were were kind of nice things. And I mean, mine, you know, is as close as we're going to get to a memoir. But also that and the song, well, songs of George Harrison, you know, is basically artwork inspired by the lyrics and it gives you the full lyrics and i mean mine you get what to me is more interesting which which is facsimiles of the lyrics um, mm-hmm. and his comments song by song and um you know olivia has just expanded it uh to include a bunch more songs from i mean that book came out in like 1979 originally or 80 right um, 1980, I think. Yeah, so Olivia added a lot of uh, things that George had done, you know, up to brainwash material. Um, and it included a bonus disc, too, but that was a little disappointing because it was just a track from the early takes CD on vinyl. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was mm-hmm. no real difference. Uh, so, um, but the expansion was kind of nicely done and i'm glad that that at least has come out as a trade pay, a trade book as well not just the you know expensive genesis book um so but those books i think are, are something since we're talking about legacy and legacy is uh medium agnostic let's say uh books i guess count sure i think about just to bounce off your thing about compilations i mean it, it, entirely apart from my own thorough lack of interest in compilations. I think, um, I think that at this point, it's kind of too late, right? I mean, nobody does things like that on CD anymore. I think the most we can hope for is a Spotify playlist that the Harrison Estate, you know, puts together officially or something. But, of course, anybody can put together a Harrison Spotify playlist and other people can listen to it. So um, maybe that's something we should do. <laughs> Mm. No, we raised this whole point when Pure McCartney came out. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a valid point to be made. But I still think that if you are a novice fan and you don't know George Harrison's solo catalog at all, Mm -hmm. you want something that's already prepared for you. Right. So whether you buy it in physical format or whether you buy it digitally, Mm -hmm. you know, you can buy it as a digital collection anyway. It should be made. There should be someone to tell you, here are the choicest cuts. Here are some of his biggest hits. These are the essential songs from George Harrison's solo catalog. And you need someone to make that decision for you because you're not going to go and listen to every single song online from every single solo album. That's a lot of work. When you start out as a fan, you want a compilation to introduce you to the best of that artist's work that spans his entire catalog. And you want a booklet. To, yeah, I do. <laughs> you want a booklet to read, you know, telling you what the stuff is, when it was done, how it was done, why it was done, what was going on in his life, you know? I mean, right? why wouldn't you? So, yeah. I still think a compilation is valid in that regard. Yeah. So let's move on to Mr. McCartney. And uh, this is going to be hard to do concisely, considering what a huge catalog he's had. But let's start with you, Steve. How has he handled his solo legacy well you are correct sir that uh there is a lot to 
there is a lot to cover. And in fact, I mean, when we talked about his uh, movie collection uh, uh, credits uh, a few weeks ago, you know, we said that was one place where he should uh, do a compilation. Not only that, I mean, his classical his classical work has never been collected in a compilation. I don't know that that would work as well because, in my opinion, his classical work is somewhat disjointed and and not as it's not up to the the quality level of his of his rock stuff. So I don't know that uh, you know I don't know how you do that. I mean you'd also you'd actually have to cut some of those works down. I'm not sure he would uh, how he'd feel about that. But still, I mean there. You know, I mean, as far as his, as far as his works go, I mean, he's been so busy touring and 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 putting out albums every couple of years that it's hard to say, you know, really grade him very much on compilations. I mean, we got into this discussion again this week. I don't think Pierre McCartney was the best collection of of his work. Maybe maybe four discs is not enough. I don't know, um, mm-hmm. but. But I knew you'd agree with that. But but uh, but, uh, but uh, I don't know. Everybody has their own opinion about what his best work is. So you know, it, it depends on who you ask. It's not it's not so uh, clear cut. Maybe maybe it, I know there's a lot of people that do like that compilation. So may, maybe it would have been better. It'd be better to do two separate compilations: one of his early work, you know, maybe uh, up through Wings, and one after. You yeah, know. but Wings is Wings is ten years out of almost forty. Well, I mean, well, he's done Wings. He's done a Wings compilation before, so I mean, it's not, it's not like he hasn't done that. But maybe, maybe it's time for another Wings compilation, or you know, up to up to a certain point, even if you wanted, if you only want to go ten, the 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 Wings year. I mean, if you want to go a little further than the Wings years, but well, it, I definitely would. You know. Well, I know, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, I, I think you know he could. There are collections he can do. I think, like he's, we said, the movie music is a great idea. Can we pat ourselves on the back for that one? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I think that's a, a, an excellent idea. I think he. I think that's something he really, really needs to do. It would be. I think it'd be. You know, maybe the classical would be another good one if he threw in. Some you know maybe stuck uh, some you know avant garde stuff maybe uh, you know some of the the, um, the fire brains fireman come. yeah fireman stuff that kind of stuff you know that kind of stuff uh, throw that in with the with the classical stuff I think actually that'd probably be a good idea uh, to do that and well, maybe even sneak in a, a little bit of uh, Carnival of Light if uh, he can uh, he can get the rest of them to agree although I'm sure they probably won't. But, um, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of, it's not like there hasn't been a lot of um, McCartney collections. There have been. Um, I still hold that I think Pure McCartney did not do the best job of uh, of taking care of his career. There are probably other ways that, that can be done. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you can't, it's hard to judge him, as we said, because he's still producing and he's still you know, artist in residence, I guess you could call it. Um, so, anyway. That's it? That's it. Okay. Alan, how about you? Okay. Um, you know, like you say, it is a huge, sprawling catalog. And then if you add the live stuff, and, uh, you know, he's put out lots of live albums. But if you're talking about preserving a legacy, you kind of mean, really, to me an official recording of every single concert doesn't necessarily mean it has to come out. It could be an online archive, something like that, but all that stuff really should be preserved. It's been recorded, I'm sure. And, uh, it, it just should, uh, somehow be available on some basis to anybody who's interested in checking it out. Um, but that in itself is a huge amount now. Um, so and 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 goes back to uh really that first university tour um which he pro- may not have recorded um officially but there are bootlegs of a lot of those things around um mm-hmm. in terms of the 
official releases. Um, there's the archive series, you know, the beautifully done box sets that we've talked about as they've come out. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, not to sort of completely repeat what we've said, but for each one of them, you know, we've been either impressed or not impressed in different ways. I think for just about all of them, we've wished there was more material. For me, the Flowers in the Dirt Box was so far the best of them. I mean, it had, you know, two sets of demos with Elvis Costello, uh, video uh, with, you know, the making of the, of the album, Paul and Elvis doing some of the joint things they did. Um, there was a lot of great stuff in there. Um, but as we know from those sessions and the sessions leading up to those sessions, because there was the whole audition thing that led to the Russian album, um, there's a lot more tape. Um, and a lot more stuff that I think everybody would be interested in hearing. And, you know, I think that the fact that I, okay, this we know for sure, just from the bootleg material that has come out over the years, which has been quite plentiful, just because he hasn't put it out, doesn't mean that it's not up to par. And it also doesn't mean that he might not eventually put it out. I mean, look Mm -hmm. at, you know, things of... I think like my carnival was like, you know, years before he put it between when he recorded it and when he put it out. And a lot of those things that were going to be on cold cuts, he's returned to numerous times, added new instruments to replace the vocal, replace this or that. I mean, and so there were several versions of those tracks where the recording of the track now spans several years because he's kept going back to them. Mm, um, like a love for you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, which, you know, finally turned up in a film soundtrack. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of that, uh, there's a lot of stuff that really needs to come out in an organized way. And, uh, you know, I I think it should be done while he's alive, uh, too. So, um, come on, get on it, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I well, don't. I don't agree that there should be a compilation of his classical work. And I'm speaking really? as someone who kind of likes the classical work. But the thing is, a classical work to me is not something that you can excerpt. I mean, it's it's like you know, you get an album of Beethoven's greatest hits, and it's got one movement from the mm. Fifth Symphony, and one that is rubbish. You know, and and I don't want to see I don't want to see that happen to any composer, and that includes Paul. So um, I, I, you know, I do th- wish that he he's got more classical stuff that could come out. Now, some of his classical stuff I've liked a lot. Some of it I haven't been that impressed with. Which one impressed you the most? Uh, you know, I really liked Liverpool Oratorio. That was the did very you really. Yeah, I hmm. did. Um, because first of all, he's working in extended song forms, and one thing this guy can do is write a song. Okay, they happen to be orchestral. There happen to be you know material in between the verses, long instrumental sections. That's fine. They're still fundamentally songs. Um, the orchestrations, which were done by or with. Carl Davis were nicely done. There was a section with a long violin solo, which I remember when I went to review it in Liverpool. Uh, you know, there was no, they wouldn't let you look at the score in advance. They wouldn't let you see or hear anything in advance. So hearing it in the audience was the first time I heard it, and I remember feeling that that long violin solo suggested that he could be actually an interesting concerto composer, and. He hasn't written a concerto that we've heard, but we know that he has written a concerto because uh, in 2007, when I interviewed him about Memory Almost Full, he mentioned he was working on a guitar concerto and that right after our interview, the guitarist, whose name was Carlos Bonell, who he was working with, was going to be coming over to work on it. So I would love to hear some of that stuff. And I know Carlos Bonell, he's a great guitarist. Um, Hmm. So I would love to hear it with Carlos Bonell playing it, or Carlos Bonell's teacher, who Paul has worked with before, which is John Williams. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. I mean, there, there, there is that classical stuff. I, I think it deserves a bit more respect than it, than it has gotten, um, because I think that 
You know, my feeling about the classical stuff has been that, and maybe we should do a show on it at some point, but has been that a lot of the people who are particularly devoted to Paul McCartney's music aren't really equipped to evaluate classical music Hmm. that he's done. And the people who are most equipped to evaluate classical music are by and large suspicious of pop guys who do it. Not not Mm -hmm. without reason. Not without reason, but I think Paul has approached it very seriously, and uh, I, I wish he would let loose a bit with it. I mean, my criticisms of the pieces I haven't liked that much, uh, including Standing Stone and, um, I guess, um, Ecce Pormeum, were, were that he was basically writing late 19th, early 20th century stuff when he was the one who was bringing in the tape loops and the avant-garde things and was interested in Luciano Berrio and Stockhausen and, and all of the avant-garde classical stuff. I kind of wish that he were writing like a 21st century classical composer. And I don't know why he's afraid to do that because he's got ideas, but... uh but anyway, th- this is a discussion for another time, probably. Um, oh, I can I can see a full show on this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the film music idea, yeah, absolutely. Uh, his artwork has come out a little bit. His uh, poetry has come out a little bit. Um, both of them have, well, the poetry, I guess, in particular, you know, took some criticism. But I, I kind of think that the people who were most interested in his work kind of enjoyed him doing those readings and having the book itself, you know, even though some of them were song lyrics, some of them weren't, it doesn't matter. I kind of think that stuff should come out in an organized way. And uh, also, it would be so great if he would do a real memoir (laughs) and, you know, be (laughs) totally forthright in it. I mean, until now, the best we have is many years from now, which has an awful lot of info in it. But it's not totally a memoir, you know. It's really sort of a big extended interview with someone who he knew and trusted really well and, you know, sort of opened up to a bit. But you you kind of wonder what what what's left out and what was left on the cutting room floor and that kind of thing. So, and we're talking about the solo legacy, and many years from now is very heavily into the whole Beatle period. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be, let's say, a volume two of that at the very least. But mm. um, but a memoir would be cool. I mean, I, I don't have any illusion that he'd write it himself. But, you know, if he were to, like, you know, call me next Tuesday and say, <laughs> you you up for this? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I would do it. <laughs> they can call I, me, too. I have I have some breaking news, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of Mr. McCartney, he is releasing vinyl versions of the stuff that he did on Concord um, on November seventeenth. Pipes of Peace, Ram, Band on the Run, Van, uh, McCartney Two, McCartney, and Tug of War. Did those all not all come out in vinyl editions? I thought they did. They, I think they did on Concord, but they're sw- now switched over to to Capital. Remember? Oh, oh. oh. right. So okay. we can get them with new labels. You can get hey, them with new labels. I've done now. that. <laughs> so I'm sure. I, I'm I guess sure I have the, to do it again. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. And that's another thing. You know, when you look at the catalog here, Paul is very good at making sure everything comes out on CD, digitally, and on vinyl. Mm-hmm. And high quality digital files, and he makes he makes sure That's there right. is plenty to buy. There is not there is never a shortage of McCartney material to buy ever. I don't I don't know what you're talking about, Steve. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, this is something we we were talking before the show. Someone put a comment on our uh, YouTube um, clip from the last show about how Yoko has been very careful to monetize all of John's stuff. And it was actually, you know, it was not really, didn't strike me as a very fair comment. Um, it, it's, it's a very old charge, you know, that anytime Yoko does anything, no matter how much we actually want the stuff, there's someone there saying that, oh, she's just sort of, you know, doing it for the cash. Okay, fine. I want to see this person say the same <laughs> thing about Paul, you know? Right. 
listen, you know, these people are in the business to earn money through their art. That's what they do. I mean, the point he's making is that, okay, John's dead and he didn't want the stuff out. I'm not sure to what degree that second part of the sentence is true or not. Um, And yet you hear he was a big bootleg collector. He was a big bootleg collector. That's right. right. He, he was, talked about so. that, too. He talked about that, and he talked about how once he heard some bootlegs that excited him, he wanted it to come out. So on one hand, you know, we supposedly have John saying, I don't want any old stuff coming out after I die. And on the other hand, he gets a bootleg, and yeah, I'm calling the others and saying we should put this out, you know. So, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't necessarily get into someone's head and say what they were – would have done or not. And and I also would want to point out, I mean, since we got into, since I got us into this discussion about that comment, that the hugest mass of material that she put out, the Lost Lennon tapes, didn't, you know, cost us anything, right? You know, she put that out for free. Mm-hmm. I don't know what her arrangement with Westwood One was, but... That was, uh, from a fan's point of view, that was just sort of a gift. Yeah, that's true. Right. That's she never right. released that commercially. If you wanted to buy the bootlegs, that's up to you. No one's forcing you. Right. Mm. Right. So. so let me very quickly sum up my thoughts about Paul and preserving his solo legacy. Uh, we talked about compilations. He's done a good job. Great job. I don't know about that. Wings Greatest was the first one, and I think it really was a pretty good compilation for its time, even though it didn't have Listen to What the Man Said, which hit number one in America, which didn't make any sense. But overall, it was a good compilation for 1978. You had All the Best, which was pretty good for its time. Wingspan, I think, was uh, an interesting concept because, kind of like what he did later in Pure McCartney, he had one CD that was all singles, and the second CD was album cuts – or what he called history, even though some of them actually were hits. But that was his attempt at going a little bit deeper into his solo catalog. So I thought that was a pretty good idea at the moment. Pure McCartney, you know, I happen to like it. I would pick a lot of different cuts other than the ones that he picked, but I found them very interesting, and especially when you're talking about album cuts in in particular. Because when he picks something like Souvenir, which I think is a fantastic song from Flaming Pie, has a great R&B feel to it. I get excited when he's saying, you know, this is a song I want people to hear or Don't Let It Bring You Down or any of those songs. When he picks songs that are not the hits, I'm very curious as to what he picks. And I thought it was a good compilation. Everyone, if, if you asked every single fan of this show to put together a four CD compilation of Paul's solo material, everyone's collection would be different. That's just a fact. He needs another compilation and... As one of our uh, often, we have him on the show, guests, Darren DeVivo said, he needs like a 10 CD compilation. And I'd be all for that. He's been great at remastering his catalog, although he's very slow at it. A lot of people complain about it. We want to be able to live long enough for his entire catalog to be remastered. The only thing I ever complain about with his remastered catalog is that sometimes he's a little chintzy on the bonus audio and video material. But there are exceptions to that. Like you said, Alan, Flowers in the Dirt, tremendous. Mm -hmm. Venus and Mars had a lot of material. Uh, McCartney, too, had a full CD of material there. Tug of War was handled so well. And you can't complain about the packaging with all the photos, all the Linda McCartney photos. I think he's extremely generous in that regard with all the photo books. So I think overall, the remastering has done a very good job. I wish there was a little bit more bonus material. But most importantly, the sound quality on all the remasters is phenomenal. Uh, It's the best I've ever heard Ram is the remaster. You know, there are certain ones that are like that. As far as promoting his own solo work... Like I said before, a new album comes out, he gives interviews, he promotes it, doesn't do overviews of his solo career. And the main thing that I would complain about, as I've said here on this show, are his concerts. Because even though he is a tremendous performer and a great showman, ever since the 70s, most of the songs that he plays are Beatles. And we can get into why he does that. That could be a whole show to itself. You know, about 60% of his show is Beatles material. He does a little bit, the core hits from the 70s, although he does play some album cuts. 
like 1985 he'll do, Letting Go he's brought back from time to time, and on the current tour, it's like every other show he does that. Once in a while he does High, 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 and then he does songs from the new album. He does Here Today. That's like the only song, I think, from the 80s on this tour. He does very little in between from the Beatles and the new album. That's a very warped way of looking at someone's career. You know, the majority of his material has been between the Beatles and the new album. And I just wish that it was more spread out. At the same time, it's very hard for me to be critical when he's 75 years old and he doesn't have to do anything. You know, he's still giving you his all. And there are so many people who rightfully so are thrilled to see him. They'd be happy if all he did was Beatles, you know, and sometimes I feel like I shouldn't be complaining at all. But if you're talking about preserving your own solo legacy, he hasn't done enough as far as performing his own solo music. And two major complaints, if I have any about this particular subject, when he puts his remasters out, his tours do not reflect it. Flowers in the Dirt comes out doesn't do anything from it whenever he's put out any of these remasters i know he's been doing here today since 2002 but when tug of war came out did he pick anything from that no and uh you know this is this is my gripe you know you'd think that he'd be proud he puts all this effort into these remasters and the packaging of it and then he tours and he doesn't play anything from them and then on top of all that, when you see him live and you look at the merchandise that's there, you don't see his latest album there for sale. Although I did happen to notice at the three concerts that I went to that they had Flowers in the Dirt, the two CD set for sale. But normally the new album he didn't have for sale. It's mainly the T-shirts and everything else. And then the other thing is when he has a new album out and he tours with it, it's great that he does material from it. But then when he does his next tour and he has a, another new album, he abandons the previous album. So, you know, it's almost like you're saying I'm playing it only because it's the newest album instead of being proud of the work itself. It's just my general feelings about this. So, you know, on the one hand, it's tough for me to be critical because, you know, his shows are tremendous. There's no doubt about it. I love seeing all the positive reviews. But as someone who's listened to all the music that he's put out, I just wish that there'd be a better representation of what he's done as a solo artist. And I don't think he's done that. In the 70s, yes. Wings Over America tour, yes. Even the 79 tour in the UK, yes. He was then starting to, to bring a few Beatle, more Beatles songs in there. You know, that's my general feeling about that. But on the positive side of things... The man is always working. He's either touring or recording new music. He's always in the news. One thing that we never bring up here, since you mentioned the classical music, Alan, is that every now and then there'll be a showing of one of his classical works somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. It'll be somewhere in Europe. All of a sudden, Standing Stone is showing somewhere. You know, And that's really good, because this way, it's not like it's... It was released when it was, and then it's forgotten. He's still bringing it back occasionally. I love the fact that he does that. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought that it was great when he put out the video collection that he did, which was fantastic up to that moment. You know, and uh, to have he's made so many videos, it's great that he actually put out a video collection that was pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. so. Overall, he's done a very good job. I would only complain mainly about the fact that live in concert he doesn't do enough solo material that's you know that's my biggest complaint about paul and you know if radio stations are not going to play his new stuff and they don't play most of his solo music the only way for audiences young and old to hear any of this stuff is if he plays it so if you want that legacy the solo music to endure a lot of it is on him mm -hmm. you know so that's just how i feel about that Anybody want to comment on that? That was short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was short? <laughs> You're kidding, right? No, I, I, I was joking with you. Um, I, get the, the, I, I kind of agree with the, with the solo thing, but I think he's got, he's got this problem that he's a Beatle, and people want to hear Beatles more than they want to hear solo, Ken. Whether you, I, you know, I, I really think so. So uh, and and given that there's only two Beatles left and he's the, I mean if if Lennon was al alive probably it would be easier but the fact that between Lennon and McCartney he's the only one around 
he's got that Beatle pressure on him, and, and and there's no getting around the fact that people will want to hear Beatles from him. So yeah, well, that was another thing that I wanted to bring up, which is that really and truly, of the two primary songwriters in the Beatles, he's all we have left, and so he is really become the keeper of the flame. Right. You right. Know? So and, he's got he's got no choice to, than to, to not play Beatles. He has to play Beatles. Oh, I'm he not denying play, that. He has I'm to not play denying, a lot of Beatles. Well, he that depends. He, he he can do whatever he wants to do, really. And Ringo, and if he Ringo doesn't play play mostly solo stuff, does he? Well, I mean, uh, these he, days it's it's mixed. It's kind of half and half. He doesn't do a lot of songs. Actually, these days Ringo does about ten or eleven songs. And I think it's pretty balanced, but he doesn't really, again, Ringo does not cover his solo catalog well live at all. He does those a few hits from the 70s. He might play something new from his latest album, and the rest is Beatles. I'm I'm just going to look up. I believe he pretty much sticks with Beatles. I mean, he he doesn't really do a whole lot of... He does do some solo stuff, and remember, it's always hard to get him to do new solo stuff. That's right. See, and I'm looking I'm looking down the list here of uh of the most recent show in uh at uh, Marin uh, Center in in uh, San Rafael, California. Matchbox, it don't come easy. What goes on? Boys, don't pass me by yellow submarine. You're 16. Back off Boogaloo. Uh I want to be your man. Um uh, photograph with a little help and give peace a chance. There's really more Beatles songs there. I mean, he does, he, he can maybe about one third solo to two thirds Beatles. Okay. But if you were to take a look at all of his tours, there are times when that was much more balanced, especially when he played his newer stuff. Well, when he was doing, I think round hits, it was pretty, you know, it was- no, no. If you, if you really were to look at all of his tours, you would find that there was more, it was pretty balanced between the solo and the Beatles. Because he would tend to play one or two songs from his newest album, you know, like with uh, Time Takes Time. He was doing Weight of the World and Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go. Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends which tour you're talking about, but I think it was much more balanced. But I think that ultimately, Paul, Paul can decide whatever he wants to do. And we've had this discussion before. If he's going to play stadium shows or 20,000 seat venues... And he's choosing to not do a lot of concerts a year, actually does something like 30 to 40 shows a year. Then he probably feels that if he's going to play to so many people, he's got to make it more mass appeal and therefore play a lot of Beatles. But he could go another route if he wants to. That's all his choice. He could play smaller venues and announce that it's going to be more solo music. He's in control of what he does. Well, of course he is. So that's all, that's all his final decision. And he loves being a crowd pleaser. And he loves, you know, the feedback that he gets from the audience. He still does. I see it in every one of his shows. He genuinely enjoys what he's doing. So, oh, of course. Of course. Uh, but, uh, again, um, I think that, um, that, he, that both, they, Paul does mostly Beatles. Ringo does mostly Beatles. I mean, there's no getting away from that. By I'm the way, not, uh, I'm not denying that, but I am okay. saying we're talking about preserving the solo catalog here. So you're asking me my opinion, and in that one way, what he does live, he's not really preserving the solo catalog well. Neither is Ringo. That's all that I'm saying. Right. Neither is Ringo because he's doing mostly he's doing mostly Beatles too. But again, Ringo Ringo like Paul knows what people want to hear. And that's what they that's really what they want to hear. I mean, didn't didn't we hear at one point or didn't he say in yep. an interview that when they he was doing new songs from the new album, people were going for their for their you know, going for the bathroom and stuff? I mean that's you know, that's what happens. So, I know that. We we've talked about this time and time right. again. But I am right. saying that if you want to preserve the solo catalog, you gotta expose it. That's all that I'm saying here. If you're going to rely mainly on Beatles, you're not helping the solo catalog. That's all that I'm saying. Where's the where's the money though? The money is in the Beatle catalog, not in the solo catalog. I yeah, guess. you know, I think we're we're confusing something, which is you know whether he thinks of touring as 
part of the project of um, of dealing with his legacy. Uh, and mm. if if he does, he is looking at his legacy as everything he's done in his career, which includes the Beatles. And I don't think he necessarily makes a distinction between which part of his legacy he wants to preserve more live. Yeah, I don't disagree with you that he has sometimes given it short shrift, and I especially don't disagree that he's been bizarrely disinclined to play stuff from the reissues that he's putting out even while he's on tour. That's a little bizarre. You know, the Stones, when they reissued Sticky Fingers, went out and did concerts of, you know, the whole album, you know, plus a bunch of other stuff. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah, it would have made sense not what he wanted to do for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, in a three hour show, you got to figure in a three hour show, he could have done worse than to play all of flowers in the dirt, say, and then two hours plus of other stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, I just, I just reviewed speaking of the Rolling Stones. Um, the other day I just reviewed their new release, which is a complete live performance from 2015 of the sticky fingers album. They entirely. They'd never done it, you know. They'd never done the whole album live on stage, right. in one show, and they did it in 2015 at the Fonda Theater in L.A. And they just put it out on, on, uh, on DVD and and CD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, Could there's there's right. All right, that was a, an interesting thought there. What you brought up, Alan. Maybe Paul doesn't make a distinction between the Beatles and his solo. It's all his work. Mm -hmm. He may look at his his catalog that way. I don't know. And but why, anyway, and why will... shouldn't he really? You know, I mean, wouldn't well, you? Let Let's say you were in a really big group, and then you did some other stuff, and and you now have made peace with whatever you know uh, unpleasantness occurred at the end of the group. You now look at it back, uh, look back at it all as your legacy. Um, I, I don't think it's unnatural. Mm -hmm. That's very possible. Yeah, I. I don't know. I could see both sides of this. <laughs> anyway, that brings the show to a close. And so what we'd like to do now is give everybody our uh, contact information, starting with you, Steve. Uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. You can catch me on um, my personal Facebook page where I post about it. Uh, anything I feel like, uh, but if you want just Beatles, Beatles news and information is where I post about Beatles, and I also post uh, a lot in the Things We Said Today Beatles radio show page, which is the page for the show. And you can catch us on Twitter at Things We Said Fab, and you can catch the show. Uh, you can email the show directly at Things We Said uh, Today Radio Show at okay. gmail dot com. And as for you, Alan. Um, either get me through the things we said today email or on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. As I say in just about all the shows every week, there is uh, Beatles Trivia on my website, Beatles Trivia Questions or Beatle Games, and you can win one of nine prizes every single week. I also do special contests periodically, and sometimes I don't know when they're going to start, but there is a special contest page which you should go to because if you, uh, if you know about a contest when it starts, then you'll get the jump on it and have an advantage over everybody else. Right now I'm giving away Ringo's new album, Give More Love, your choice on CD or vinyl as part of the special contest. It's also part of my trivia page as well. And I can tell you that uh, even though, well, once in a while, I give out a non-Beatles product, the next special contest, which will probably start next week, is um, the new compilation from Brian Wilson of his solo music, which is called Playback. So if you want to win that, then go to the website and go to my special contest page at kenmichaelsradio.com. All right, so this has been a great show, and uh, once again, we, we are you know, sending our prayers and good thoughts out to Tom Petty and his family, and um, like I said before, 
there'll be a tribute to him if if the news is bad this week. We certainly hope that's not the case. But we want to thank all of you for listening to our show. And on behalf of Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michael saying thank you all so much for listening. And we will see you next time. Thank you.